scripture today from Galatians chapter 4, verses 1 through 7. I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave, though he is, un- he is the owner of everything. But he is under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. In the same way, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who are under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the Spirit of his Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son, and if a son, then an heir through God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Today, for Palm Sunday, we leave behind the Hebrew Bible, what we know of as the Old Testament, and come to the New Testament, the story of Jesus. The entire Bible has been building on this problem of sin, which is not just the bad stuff we do, but but a broken relationship with God that humanity just can't seem to fix itself. And the Hebrew Bible makes the point over and over again that humanity can't do it that God is going to have to do something about it. And so we've been watching this epic story as God has has brought this plan into being. Abraham and a family, Joseph and tribes. Through Moses and Joshua, they gain freedom and a promised land. But always sin persists. The judges can help for a generation, but by the next generation, they're all doing what's right in their own eyes again. The kings, which were supposed to be this great hope of Israel, well, even the greatest of kings, David, was an adulterer and a murderer. The family that became tribes, that became a nation, then ends up in exile and all seems lost. Humanity, exiled since the garden, can't seem to put it together. How is God going to fix this? But even in the Old Testament, there's a budding hope. Even through the struggles of those pages, God is working something out. There's a Messiah coming, an anointed one, a Christ, a Savior, who would bring healing to the world and would fix the problem of sin and teach humanity how to live. He would be a human, yet somehow God, and and he would suffer, but by his wounds we would be healed. So we might say that, that Jesus is born into this long story, But the truth is, the story of Jesus comes way before Christmas. The New Testament reveals that Jesus was a part of the Trinity, part of the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit since the beginning. As John puts it, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus' life does not begin at his birth. He has always been. And then, before the world was created perhaps overwhelmed and overflowing with love and a desire for relationship, God decided to create the world. And Jesus was central to this work because it's always Jesus' job in the Trinity to make God visible. The Bible affirms that all things are created through him and for him, and that nothing was created that was uh, made apart from him. This means that Jesus continues to be part of creation, keeping it together, holding it together in himself. He's the creator. He's the sustainer. And then throughout the Old Testament, there seems to be these times where God shows up in a physical space. There are appearances of God in a human-like form in the garden. Sometimes the arm of the Lord is mentioned by Psalms and the prophets. Sometimes an angel of the Lord that is clearly more than an angel. And so we can look in the Old Testament and see Jesus there already. But then, somewhere around the turn of the first century, a young, seemingly insignificant Jewish girl got an unbelievable and unfathomable visit from God. And was told that she was pregnant with the God child. And that this child would grow to save people from sin and death. And in an event heralded only by shepherds, the center and purpose of all creation was born as a baby. In the Bible's language, 
the word, the ultimate truth and reality of human existence became flesh and dwelled among us. Jesus humbled himself in Paul's language, giving up his place with God to become a person, to enter into flesh. Jesus was therefore holy and unique, being a human being and being God and being able to represent both before each other. We know very little of Jesus' childhood. We know that he went to Egypt when he was very little, that he grew up in a very small town of Nazareth. We know a story of him being 12 years old, that he went to the temple and was found teaching and and didn't go back with his parents, which sounds terrible to us, what bad parenting. But the reality is 12 years old was an age where he, he was just about to get married and uh, didn't have to stay with his parents all the time. I wonder what Jesus was like as a child. What games did he like to play? Perhaps the silence of the scriptures on his childhood means it was a pretty normal childhood. He trained as a tecton, which we would translate often carpenter, but really there's not that much wood over there. It it would mean more like a general builder or a contractor. He could probably use stone and clay and tile. We also know that Jesus had brothers and sisters. One of his brothers named Jacob, which is typically translated James ever since the King James Bible, became a leader in the early church. And then when Jesus is seen as an adult, we we know nothing of his father Joseph since he was 12 years old. Probably that means Joseph had passed away. Around the age of 30, Jesus began his earthly ministry. That was typically the age that a rabbi could strike out on his own without following another rabbi. Jesus first does a miracle at a family wedding at his mother's request, turning water into wine. I wonder what made Mary think that he could do that. Had he done something like this before? Had he spent a lot of time at other parties turning water to wine or stones into bread? Interestingly, his ministry started with a party, and he did a lot of partying throughout his life. But his ministry really gets going with his baptism and his 40 days in the wilderness. His cousin John the Baptist was washing people in the Jordan and called calling for the repentance of sin. He doesn't want to do that to Jesus because he doesn't think Jesus has any sin, but he does so at Jesus' request. And as Jesus comes out of the water, God the Father says from heaven, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And the Holy Spirit comes down and it's something like a dove. Jesus goes out and spends 40 years in or 40 days in the Judean wilderness mirroring the 40 years that Israel spent. He is tempted in his weakness and yet he does not sin. And then over the next 3 years Jesus conducted a ministry primarily in the region of Galilee around the Sea of Galilee or the Sea of Tiberias with several journeys to the south to Jerusalem and at least one to Caesarea Philippi up in the north. His earthly ministry involved a lot of teaching, miracles, and relationships. So let's think about each of those. Jesus spent a lot of time teaching. Most of what he taught you can find in other places in the Hebrew Bible or in teachings of, teachings of his day, but, but often he had his own little twist on the teaching. Most of, his, most of his teaching was paradoxical. The last will be first. Blessed are the meek and the poor in spirit. Faith the size of a mustard seed can move mountains. Some of his teaching was extreme. Like if your eye causes you to sin, you should pluck it out. That's a quote I like to bring out when people say that they read every and follow every verse of the Bible literally. And I say, then why are your eyes still in your head? Some of his teaching is really pretty funny. Like the idea of a camel going through the eye, a little eye of a needle. Or if you're going to comment on the speck on somebody else's eye, you should first take a big log out of your eye. Much of what Jesus did, he taught with metaphors and strange kinds of stories called parables. He took everyday things and made them into lessons about how the kingdom of God works. In other words, how the world really works when sin is not in charge. He told of sheep gates, living water, and the bread of life. He told stories of losing sheep, losing coins, and losing sons. 
of impractical sowers and soils that do not accept seeds. He told a famous one about a Samaritan who helps at his own expense with, with a Jew and where a rabbi would not have done it. Not everyone liked these stories, especially those who are wealthy at the expense of others in the religious elite, because sometimes they were actually the bad guys and attacked sometimes in scathing fashion in these stories. In addition, Jesus did a lot of miracles. He caused great catches of fish, fed large groups of people with small lunches and cursed fig trees. He calmed storms, walked on water, miraculously moved through an an angry crowd. The world that was broken by the fall seems to obey the voice of Jesus. And many of his miracles were healings. He healed many who were blind, lame, and had seizures. He healed some at a distance and some by touching. Some by just commanding them to get up and walk. One woman was healed of some kind of bleeding disorder just by touching him. In another case, Jesus spit on the earth and made mud with with his hands and wiped it in the man's eyes and actually did it twice to produce the healing. Another man, he simply spit in his eyes. He even brought several people back from the dead. The effects of sin are answered in Jesus. And he seems to be healing, undoing the fall in person after person after person. Now you would think that people would not have problems with miraculous acts and healing, but some did. The religious elite especially did not like it when Jesus did these things on the Sabbath when you weren't supposed to work. But Jesus cared more about hurting people than he did about their rules of propriety. And along the way, as Jesus traveled and taught and healed, he interacted with lots of people, sometimes in small groups, sometimes in large groups. Jesus seems to have this amazing love and patience for thieves, for prostitutes, for the terminally ill, for the outcasts. He healed not just physical infirmities. He had this amazing ability to heal people's souls. We have records of many of these interactions, like a rich young ruler who who wanted to follow Jesus but couldn't quite give up on his possessions and maybe couldn't give up on his reputation because he finds Jesus in the middle of the night. By contrast, a Samaritan woman meets Jesus in the middle of the day, and after Jesus tells her all of her wrongs, she tells the story to the whole town. There was a woman caught in adultery who was about to be stoned, but Jesus drew in the dirt and said, He who has no sins casts the first stone. There's even this short guy named Zacchaeus who was this wee little man, but he wanted to see Jesus, so he climbed up in a sycamore tree, hoping just to catch a glimpse of this man. See, Zacchaeus was a tax collector. He, he was an outcast. He was not welcomed by his fellow Jews because he has sold them out to pay to collect taxes for the Romans. But Jesus ate with Zacchaeus. He ate with a lot of people that he wasn't supposed to. He touched lepers, played with children, and shared tables with all of those. He had no sense of boundary, no sense of public expectations. And wherever he went, he brought hope and joy and love. But, but of course, he also created doubters, critics, and haters. He still has that effect today. The religious elite seemed to want to trap him, to test him, to silence him. Some called him crazy. Some called him a crook and wanted him killed. Others followed, if not out of loyalty, or, but then at least out of intrigue or in hopes of a free meal. Jesus poured himself especially into 12 disciples, and then even among those 12 to three in particular, Peter, James, and John. You can imagine the, the laughs and the inside jokes that these 13 guys would have formulated traveling together for three years. But Jesus also had other friends, like Lazarus, who had died and that Jesus had gone to to be with him and raise him from the dead. A number of women as well, such as Mary Magdalene, Salome, Mary, and Martha. Jesus understood broken relationships. And he was betrayed by a friend, denied by another, abandoned by all the rest. 
but he lived his life showing people how to how deep and loving relationships could be experienced. In so many ways, day by day, chapter by chapter, as we read the stories, Jesus was living a life that humanity could not achieve. He related to people. He healed. He taught. And and he was undoing the fall little by little. As Jesus was fully human, he ate. He got tired. He got thirsty. he, He wept. He was tempted. Yet through it all, he did not sin. He did not fail. And yet, the question of this large story arc of the salvation history, this whole story of the Bible still has this big question. How was humanity to be saved? And Jesus had no sin. Jesus was undoing the fall little by little. But how was this plan going to be the answer for humanity? If the wages of sin was death, Jesus would have to die. He made statements throughout his ministry that he was going to die, even saying at least once that he would be lifted up, a reference to the cross. He knew it was coming, how it was going to happen. And he even willingly traveled to Jerusalem for it. He showed up for the Passover after about three years of his earthly ministry. He was there betrayed and abandoned, put through the mockery of a trial. He was stripped and beaten and whipped, a crown of thorns placed on his head. Jesus carried his instrument of death until someone else had to carry it for him, and he died on a cross. The enemy of the state. A political statement that was always uh, the end of political leaders and their movements. He died the death that we deserve. Our sin put him there. We were enemies of the heavenly state, and Jesus took that on for us. For one day... A dark and gloomy Saturday, all seemed lost for those disciples. But early that Sunday morning, a group of women going to the temple made a discovery that would change the lives of the disciples. In fact, all history would be changed by this news. But that is the sermon for next week. That is the chapter we will get to in our next sermon. For now, what I hope you can do is appreciate the life of Jesus. How the way he lived was always undoing the fall. All the failures of Abraham and Jacob and Judah, the judges, the kings, all those things. Jesus did not fail the way they did. And all their hopes, all their expectations that have been building through the whole Old Testament, Jesus walks right into those and fulfills them. And we are called to a Jesus kind of life. The early Christians were called followers of the way. Followers of the way of Jesus. Later they're called Christians. uh, Mini Christs. People who look like Christ. May we all be inspired by the life of Jesus. That we may live a Jesus kind of life. Let me pray. Lord, I thank you for your life that you healed, that you taught, that you cared, that you loved. Lord, in this challenging time that we are facing as a country and a world, help us to be Jesus kind of people. Help us to be followers of your way. Where we can teach, let us teach. Where we can heal, let us bring healing. Where we can build relationships, let us do those so that they, so that all around us may experience the hope that we have in you. Pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.